Okay. Okay, so as Tony mentioned, the title is Personal Choices, but not quite Digital Games Ethics and Teacher Education. So um, this is actually um, a two-part project um, uh, that is, is uh, um, in progress yet. So I don't have um, much, uh, many data, but I, I, I won't be much of a data analysis. I'll just present especially things related to uh, digital gaming and um, with this um, topic related to ethics and then at the end I'll, I'll bring it to uh, my pre present, present research involving uh, would-be English teachers here in Aracaju, Sergipe. So uh, this project is funded by Saint Piquet uh, and it involves a group that I created on Steam. Steam is a, an online gaming platform, and uh, I'll talk about it a, a, a little bit more later. Later on, okay. So um, we have, before starting, some quotations here. This comes from the Big Bang Theory. Uh, fifth season, when we see Raj playing video game, and he says, got him. When Gandhi advocated his philosophy of nonviolence, I bet he didn't know how much fun it was killing stuff. Uh, and also Clifford Gertz, who says, every people loves its own form of violence. So the, the topic of uh, this presentation is uh, ethics, but not necessarily related to violence, but we know when it comes to video gaming, uh, violence is uh, almost, depending on the, the genre, um, uh, always present. So, uh, as we can see, um, what I, I want to, to, to show is how then, uh, Players lead with this thing of uh, related to ethics, sometimes violence, uh, and how it's not really possible to detach that from real world. So my previous project uh, involved also uh, would be English teachers, and uh, we uh, played a simple game called the Cave, and then we we had them answer some questions. So. Uh, a questionnaire that we did, we used in, on that platform that I mentioned earlier, Steam. Uh, so I chose two, two parts here. One of, uh, they, they played the game and then they, they uh, commented on it. The part that I found most interesting was the arrival to the shop right at the beginning. The salesman's persuasion to get what he wants, and the detail of the postcard theft, which by the way generates a reward. So he asks, is it worth such a reward generated by a theft? Okay, so that, that was some, some years ago. And then um, these comments um, kind of uh, got me interested in following uh, that idea. And then we search more deeply into uh, ethics in video gaming. Another player said, you can only progress when you do what the story tells you. The twins, for example, have to kill their parents to go on. The scientist needs to launch the rocket. The hillbilly has to burn down the park. So it's a game with seven characters, and all of them has a, a crucial part in it that um, had, has to be played in order to, to go on. So I highlighted here this part about the twins because uh, I'm gonna talk about it <coughs> later on. Uh, so I actually, uh, after that, I related to some readings that uh, I've done uh, from scholars and they mentioned similar things. So how do, how they experience certain situations when they are playing. So James Paul G. Uh, talks about this game, this uh, role-playing game called Arcanum, 
and he creates this um, character which he calls Big Beat. Uh, and he says that his character is a delicious blend between his doing and his not doing. And he involves with this character so much that then he resents some actions that he has to take. For example, uh, Big Beat has to uh, sell a ring that she had been given by an old man earlier on. So he gets so disappointed that he left. He leaves the game and starts all over again. So Janet Murray in a classic book about uh, literature and uh, video games, uh, reports her um, experience with a game, a very simple game called Mad Dog McCree. So it's kind of um, act what you have to do actually is shoot um, the targets on screen. And then she finds herself very amused with that. And she um, becomes aware of this authentic but disquieting side of her personality. On one side, she, she, she is a, a pacifist she calls herself a pacifist mother in real life, uh, but also ha who has this kind of pleasure when playing um, this kind of video game uh, that relates to when she was younger and would enjoy watching uh, any OK and Wyatt Earp on TV. So this is just a kind of uh, introduction. Uh, um, this one of the things that I, I, I like to, to highlight here is uh, a discussion that has been going on around uh, in the literature about video games, uh, which um, is based on uh, Johan Huizinga's notion of the magic circle. And when he talks about that, he this is a, a book from 1938. He's talking about uh, physical games, and he uh, tells how uh, games are not just for fun, they may be very serious things, um, and uh, some of them might even involve some kind of ritual necessary for a certain culture, and, and involving some magic as well. But then this was taken on as if uh, this magical circle involved the digital gamer so much that he would, he or she would uh, lose um, awareness of uh, his or her surroundings. So, uh, um, so that also drew some criticism. And I, I bring here this uh, quotation from Mia Consalvo who says, the magic circle upholds structuralist definitions of concept or conceptualizations of games. It emphasizes form at the cost of function without attention to the context of actual gameplay. With contemporary games and multiplayer games and MMOs in particular, massive um, multimodal, massive on online games, massively multiplayer online games in particular, context is key. So as with uh, a lot of uh, areas now, uh, especially in the humanities nowadays, uh, literature, uh, film, uh, we cannot let go of context. So context, as she says, is key to so many things, so many studies. Uh, so that's why she refuses this idea of magic circle and that the, the player is actually uh, disconnected from his or her uh, environment. Okay, so uh, here's what um, follows then. Uh, I'm going to talk first about agency uh, of, of the player. Um, and then move to performativity, uh, and then ethics itself. Uh, and then I will, as I, I said earlier, uh, talk about this game, The Cave, 
uh, and move on to my uh, present project uh, with some comments from uh, present students related to this topic of especially ethics, but also teacher education. Okay, so drawing from um, Gareth Scott, when we talk about agency, and uh, he's talking about agency when playing, he says that it's not so much so different from other uh, areas of human activity. Uh, so if on the one side, they may respond to stimulation, they can also explore, manipulate, and influence the environment. Uh, also, so as in real life, the game, the, uh, the, game, uh, the uh, act of game, uh, playing, can involve activity that are regulated in environments that restrict our behaviors. So he uh, compares then playing with several areas of um, human activity. Also, uh, players may seek to accommodate themselves to the game rules and objectives, but they may also seek to exercise control and behave otherwise. So they are not, in other words, they are not passive all the time, if, if uh, at any time they are passive. Um, and it requires some kind of intentionality. That is, um, the players can act um, aiming at certain future uh, events, okay? But they can also intervene proactively to bring these events about. And finally, um, even if they, they have uh, this kind of intervention, uh, their actions and intentions can also, will not necessarily take them to the uh, planned or expected result. Okay, so sometimes unintended and unwanted outcomes can, be, can also be produced, just, just like as in real life as well. Okay, uh, now moving on to performativity. Um, I'm gonna bring some discussion here uh, based on a book called Performativity by James Loxley. Uh, and he mentions uh, 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 all the most important authors, especially Austin, Derrida, and, and Butler. Uh, so, I selected a few parts that are related to this discussion around the serious and the non-serious performative utterances. Uh, and it, is, it, is, it has some connection with uh, Austin saying that uh, when uh, I'm, I'm going to reproduce that um, quotation later, but he mentions that when uh, an actor and actress are on stage, uh, their utterances are not serious. They cannot take, have any effect on real life. But then Butler and Derrida challenges that idea. And that made me connect it with also video games, okay? Uh, and then if, There is this idea that, uh, well, this, some people say this is not, especially when related to violence and all, uh, um, this kind of uh, unacceptable behavior in, in video games. People might say, oh, don't worry, this is only a game. So it's not serious. So uh, my idea here is to challenge that as well. Is it just a game? Is it really just a game? So uh, Austin then, related to this, says, uh, a performative utterance will, for example, be in a peculiar way 
hollow or void if said by an actor or on the stage, or if introduced in a poem or spoken in soliloquy. Language in such circumstances is used not seriously, but in ways parasitic upon its normal use. Uh, so he is actually saying that um, whatever you say on stage or like in fiction has no real effect. And then uh, Butler um, complements that with the various conventions which announce that this is only a play, allows strict lines to be drawn between the, perform the performance and life. So separating then performance from life. And Loxley also mentions that this is a conception of performance or acting as distinct from and lesser than reality or real life. So they um, uh, suggest that what Austin is saying is that what happens on stage is not so important as what happens in real life. Um, it's only illusion, okay? And then uh, Derrida also uh, based uh, drawing from Austin mentions that then all language necessarily depends on um, a citationality that allows the repetition of the same only on the condition of a necessary difference. So this is very important here because uh, Derrida says, uh, what he says about repetition, so we repeat so many things, so many actions, so many utterances every day, but they are not always the same. They, are, they always come uh, with some kind of difference. And this is one of the things that give dyna dynamicity to, uh, to language, okay, especially. And that everything we say, everything we do, it's not, it's never, the same, always there is some kind of difference. Uh, so Butler brings that to real life then, this idea of performance. That is, we actually don't have an essential identity. We are performing every day. We are performing these actions, these acts, these uh, utterances, and they are at the same time uh, building our identities in this process. Uh, so uh, then, in that case, he draws the idea of uh, uh, performance on stage to performance in real life closer, right? So in, uh, in the NC, she challenges this idea that there is a fundamental uh, difference between interpreting a role and being ourselves. So uh, I wanted to talk about this discussion around the serious and the non-serious and performativity and um, try to apply it to video game playing uh, and see how uh, also to challenge that idea of the magic circle and see uh, how our actions when we are playing uh, are in some way um, in dialogue with our real actions and uh, our interactions with other people as well, um, our everyday actions and interactions. So coming to ethics itself, and based on Miguel Sicard's book, the ethics of computer games. Uh, we actually, when you talk about um, digital games ethics, we're not necessarily talking about the values that they bring, the values that they portray, uh, reflecting the intentions of the developers. Uh, it's not uh, related to our actions in the gameplay either. Okay, so uh, we're gonna see uh, 
a bit further later on uh, around this day in the cave when these uh, kids come to kill their, their parents. Uh, so we might ask, oh, well, is that an ethical um, attitude? Uh, so is that the way we have to, uh, to value how ethical this is, how, how ethical the game, the gamer, the player is? So for Sicard, the choices will only have any ethical uh, sense if they bring consequences that make the players reflect on their acts, uh, even when there is no choice to make, because sometimes the game requires that you uh, act in a certain way, but it forces you to reflect on, on that action. So, and uh, re to reflect about how it is um, whether it is or not related to the players, their personal and social values. So I came up with this idea of performative ethics, trying to bring, bring, bring it all together. Uh, uh, then, uh, first because as, as with um, the idea of performativity, uh, Butler's idea of performativity, uh, our identity is defined in process when, we, uh, as a result of our actions. So um, the, the, this ethics is also defined uh, while playing. And we, we don't come with it ready for the game. And it is also always in dialogue with uh, our acting in the real world. So we bring it to the game and then we take it um, transformed, take it back to the world transformed again. Uh, according to Sicard, there is a responsibility in how players uh, construct the envir ethical environment of the player community how players relate to others and what kinds of practices they allow or disallow in the game experience. This is especially related to online um, games, uh, but usually, especially on, on this uh, Steam platform that I mentioned, there are lots of communities and uh, every major digital game has at least one community built around it where people exchange ideas, uh, tips, and uh, sometimes conflicts as well. So this is all related to the game environment as well. And uh, it, it is important in the building of these ethical, uh, these ethical values in the community. So in these cases, decisions cannot be seen as strictly individual or as actions that will um, unfold only in the game universe, but which may have implications for life in society and for the reshaping of subjectivities as well. So the main idea is how these uh, uh, especially when we are talking about identity uh, and values, how uh, they can be transformed from our gaming experience. So uh, I'm going to talk about this uh, little game here, uh, which is from my previous research. Uh, I'm First, I'm gonna play a short video, which is relate, which is a, a walkthrough. A walkthrough is uh, big, um, videos that players re uh, record from their playing experience, and you usually share um, with colleagues. So this one I took from YouTube, and is is the. Um, 
about specifically the part uh, that shows when the twins have to um, perform their main task. Let me see here. Uh, can you see the, the the video here? Yes, it it's not playing though. No. Mm -mm. Is it sharing? Yes. I have a really interesting story to tell you this evening, so pay attention. It's a story of seven people and a glimpse into a dark place in each of their hearts. But be careful before you judge. There is a dark place in your heart as well. Someday you will find yourself descending by depths in search of what you desire. You might not like what you find either. But enough about you. This is about them. The twins, they just want to go outside and play. What could be more innocent than that? I feel a caution is in order, for we are about to enter a very grim part of our journey this evening. Grim not because of the atrocity we are about to witness, but because of who is going to commit it. I speak of those darling children, the twins. Watch, but don't be afraid to avert your eyes. Terribly sorry, lads. I can't let you go out and play with your friends until you've had your supper. Your mom's making your favorite. <laughs> Sausage and tater soup. Quiet down! You don't want to disturb the new twins. A beautiful house in the cultural heart of Victorian London. Two loving and caring parents. What could children want more? Apparently, what they desire most is freedom. Freedom from bedtimes and chores. Freedom to run wild with no one to hold them back. We're about to see what happens when two adorable children snap. <laughs> we have now reached the grimmest part of our grim story. For that small box shoved into the corner is the ticket out of this house for the twins. Let's watch, shall we? <laughs> if you dare. Rat poison. You know, if one were to examine this box of rat poison carefully, the instructions would read, One small thimble full added to food will cause intense, horrifying, and excruciating death. Side effects include tingling, blurred vision, occasional dryness of the mouth, and getting to go outside and play. Oh dear! Oh Greater than they're capable of imagining. 
and as with the rest of our travelers, and perhaps even you, I guess only time will tell. Shall we continue our journey? It's been so enlightening thus far. Oh, I can't wait to see what happens next. So, um, this is supposed to be a, a very innocent game, but uh, this uh, part is quite discomforting, I, I would say. And uh, so, we have seven characters that go down a cave, uh, and then they all have there to, to um, develop their parts. And uh, this one was specifically uh, with the, the twins. And you could see that the, the cave itself is the narrator. And, uh, and which is uh, quite ironic as well. So let me go back here. Um, okay. No, not this one. Well, I can't find my slides anymore. <laughs> Just a minute. But well, funny, it's uh, it, uh, we, we can't I can't find the the slides here. Really? Oh, are they on your Google Drive or someplace like that? No, it's open on my computer. But when I I click here on sharing, I can't see it. Oh. Huh. Can you try again? Maybe, you know, it's working this time. Yeah, I think it's easier now. Okay, yes. So, there you are. Sorry about that. There you are. So I I, um, I got this 
review from the internet and uh, the author says, obviously killing your parents or indeed anyone with rat poison isn't usually considered a fulfilling experience. But after a 13 minute brain bender, it's quite the gratifying outcome. Uh, so we can see here that it, he is focusing on uh, the player's experience and feelings. So how gratifying is it to come um, to the end of this challenge? Uh, successfully, of course. Uh, so uh, it doesn't matter uh, the, the contents, okay? So uh, Miguel Sicard brings gives us some uh, categories uh, related to to video games as well, and I think these ones are quite useful, especially when we talk about uh, this game, the cave. Uh, so he uh, divides these games in, in two categories: open and closed. So the open games take uh, into account the players' values, uh, the community's uh, values as well. And these can be used to develop uh, a relationship with uh, the gameplay. Whereas closed games, uh, they create an ethical experience, but they don't allow the player to access his or her values uh, beyond the limits of the game. Uh, and then he um, subdivides the, the closed games in, into another two categories again. And then uh, subtractive and, sorry, mirrored. Uh, whereas then the uh, subtractive ethics creates a moral experience, uh, but leaves the ethical reflection to the player. Whereas mirrored ethics presupposes the player as a moral being, but forces him or her to go through uh, an, um, an uncomfortable situation. So for me, the cave clearly um, classifies as this last one, closed mirrored games, uh, especially because of this uh, part that I played for you. Uh, we can see that uh, even if the player has uh, um, moral values, uh, he or she has to go through this part to move on, to continue the game. And uh, usually, depending on the, the player, of, of course, and the, uh, on the genre, uh, some players might feel uncomfortable do, doing these things. So again, this also reinforces stresses the, the idea that it's not a, a, a magic circle where you are detached from reality. You bring your feelings or emotions as well to the gameplay. Uh, well, just then as a final step here, uh, I'm gonna show some of my uh, research, uh, present research project, which is, um, takes place on this community, in this community or on Steam, as I said before, uh, a game platform. Uh, and we created a group there, me and my students. And then we invited uh, other students uh, from outside the research group to comment on a few um, topics related to ethics and teacher education. So uh, we created this discussion called ethics and the player's behavior and asked them, what type of conduct do you consider wrong and acceptable for a player in the gameplay? Um, 
and this boy Coca suffers, as he calls him, he calls himself. In every situation, the best medicine would be common sense or respect from all, but we know that there is lots of immaturity around, unfortunately. Uh, well, this seems to be common sense, but when we uh, go deeper into uh, video game, uh, digital game uh, communities, uh, th there are lots of re uh, reports of uh, accounts of uh, misbehavior of how people uh, um, act, let's say, badly or treat other people in uh, problematic ways. But uh, we, we can see that, in fact, this is similar to so many other communities, uh, online communities nowadays, social, so, social media as well. Uh, so um, we could say that uh, the ethical, ethical values are also built, built within these communities. It's not like, uh, so let's bring this common sense maturity from outside in real life and take it there and we will, we will all interact uh, in, in a good way and uh, be happy. Okay, so uh, there are lots of things going on. So uh, that's what I say, ethics is being built in this process. For this same question, uh, Rusa reported, I abandoned the game, he doesn't mention the name of the game, but it's a, a role-playing game, online role-playing game. Straight away, the game was full of players with this kind of behavior, trying to thwart weaker players just for the fun of it. It made me think about what Paulo Freire says about the oppressed dream to become the oppressor. Many players have such a behavior in an environment where they can be oppressor because they are protected by another identity in the game. Um, Next. In Mortal Kombat, then uh, also a game, due to, to the low graphic similarity with reality, especially in the first Super Nintendo games, the lack of veracity in the events in terms of powers, fatalities, or brutalities doesn't make the game so immersive. Differently from the first two that I mentioned, in which you dive head first into all the events and your choices directly interfere in the gameplay. So uh, this reminded me of a discussion brought about by uh, Bauman and uh, um, in a book that he, let me see here. Uh, in the book, does ethics have a chance in a world of consumers? When he, discusses about these um, TV programs nowadays, reality shows, as they are called, they are like uh, um, Survivor, Big Brother, and where the participants get together to reach a common goal, but soon afterwards they try to eliminate all the other participants because only one wins at the end. And he makes, uh, he relates that uh, idea to how uh, the neoliberal society works nowadays. So when I read this um, account here, uh, it reminded me of this discussion by Bauman and also by another um, situation related to that my previous project. Uh, when we, we discussed about uh, collaboration in this same game that I presented to you, The Cave, because it is uh, possible to play uh, three players together, so they have to collaborate with each other. And we cannot assume that uh, this collaboration takes place all the time, because in lots and several uh, video games, people are, uh, they collaborate only to, uh, a certain stage when it is interesting for them, but uh, afterwards they go on like uh, individually as usual. Just going back here to my previous 
slide. Uh, actually, the title here should be teacher education because I, uh, that was the discussion that we started. And this player, uh, which is a future uh, English teacher, is an undergraduate student. He uh, related this situation in the game with this idea, this call of prejudice ideas of the oppressed dream to become the oppressed. So that's all for today, for now. Thank you very much.